from the Institute of the Americas. I'm, I am the Energy Policy Associate. And today I'm going to present uh, our next uh, webinar from our webinar series 2016. Um, today we're going to speak about Argentina's oil and gas um, sector. And our agenda is going to be as following. Um, after me, Jeremy Martin, the director of the energy program, is going to give you um, welcoming words. After that, we're going to have our main presenter, Patricia Vasquez. And after that, we're going to have a Q&A um, session where you're going to be able to ask um, questions to the uh, presenter and to Jeremy as well. And we're going to finish by 11 AM San Diego time. And if you, everything, the, the whole webinar is going to be on listen mode only. And after that, we're going to have the Q&A. And here at the bottom on the main chat, that is where you will be able to ask um, questions. And I'm going to um, uh, write here. So I hope everyone was able to see it. Someone could uh, reply to that chat so I, make, I can make sure that everyone um, is been able to see it. Um, I don't see anyone responding, but I hope. Um, <laughs> there we uh, go. Yes, I see one. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Deborah. Perfect. So yeah, thank you, Josefina. So basically, uh, this is where you're going to be asking uh, um, all the questions. And just to the last uh, slide, we're going to have uh, our next uh, roundtable on energy and sustainability is coming up on Peru in Lima, taking place on the 20, uh, 14th and 15th of uh, September. So we look forward to see you there, and we'll send you uh, more information there. So thank you. And here you go. Um, it's uh, for you, Jeremy. Well, thank you. Thanks, Jacqueline, and thanks, Patricia. We're really happy. Um, you know, we've been focusing a lot, as most uh, folks interested in Latin America's energy sector uh, in the last several months been focusing on Argentina. We're really happy to have uh, Patricia. And Patricia I. Vasquez is somebody who I'm sure m many of you uh, are, are aware of. She's worked for over 20 years in areas of natural resource governance and conflicts um, for the World Bank and for various uh, organizations, the United Nations and several other institutions. Some Washington-based. She's also had a lot of experience in Africa, so she brings a, a wealth of, of developing economy, oil and gas industry experience to uh, to the table. She, for many years, was the the head of Latin America for energy intelligence, uh, um, a news publication, uh, intelligence, energy intelligence is a uh, subscription service, uh, well, very well regarded. She led their Latin America team. But more recently, and this is why we've invited Patricia today to, to join us on our webinar series, more recently Patricia authored a detailed report uh, for the Wilson Center, the Woodrow Wilson Center based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Patricia authored a report called Argentina's Oil and Gas Sector, Coordinated Federalism in the Rule of Law. So. As I mentioned, you know, we've all been very keen to focus on Argentina as the new government, as the Macri government took office in December. There had been a period of, of time where these issues of, of rule of law were something of, 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 of um, enigma. Uh, with the new government coming in, I think people have tried to take a new look at Argentina. But it's important to note that Argentina has long been a key energy market in South America, and particularly in terms of uh, pioneering efforts in regional integration in the Southern Cone, um, bringing sort of natural gas forward as, uh, as, as, the, as the principal uh, element of integration, particularly in the Southern Cone. And of course, the 2010 discovery of the Vaca Muerta by Repsol YPF was a major uh, transformation of Argentina from a South America regional energy player uh, to one that potentially could be a global player and thrust it into the global energy conversation, as did the not too long after that expropriation of Repsol's assets at YPF and the nationalization uh, of YPF. So I just mentioned a few of those as an introduction to some of the things that Patricia is going to share with us in her analysis and research. The, uh, the, the way that Argentina has managed its oil and gas resources, and especially now with the renewed attention given the Macri government and their efforts to, um, to reset the energy agenda, but also in this context of, of a more global view given the unconventional resource potential uh, 
in Argentina, you know, Vaca Muerta, but more broadly. So with that, I want to turn it over to, to Patricia to share with us her insights into her, uh, her thoughts on, on how Argentina going forward will manage the hydrocarbon sector, but particularly from a rule of law standpoint. So Patricia, thanks again for joining us and look forward to the presentation. And as Jacqueline mentioned, uh, you can post your questions in the chat function. You can do that throughout the course of the presentation and we'll come back to those uh, after Patricia's formal presentation. So, Patricia Vasquez, over to you. Thanks again for joining us. Well, first of all, thanking uh, Jeremy and the Institute for giving me a chance to share my thoughts about the rule of law in Argentina's oil and gas sector. And just to say that this is not what I'm, the ideas that I'm going to present here today are not meant to be groundbreaking theories. Mainly the idea is to give some thoughts, put some thoughts on the table, and try to provoke some debate and discussion uh, around these issues. As you know, Argentina is going through a lot of changes, and, and I think some educated uh, analysis and, and ideas could contribute to, 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 to that process. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the opinions and the thoughts from our audience during the Q&A. Um, I'm going to start with a, a bit of, of, of context. In 2001, Argentina went through its worst ever economic and financial crisis. In a nutshell, because we all know what happened, the peg of the peso to the dollar suddenly came to an end. Argentina defaulted on its debt. The, there was a currency devaluation. From one day to the next, most of the population became poor and unemployment skyrocketed. In 2003, President Nestor Kirchner was given extraordinary powers by Congress to try to find solutions to Argentines who were hurting by this economic situation. And among the people, among those hurting were utility companies whose contracts that had been previously denominated in dollars had been transferred to devalued pesos. So some of them were really hurting, and uh, because they were, they had dollar debts, and they were making devalued peso earnings. So President Kirchner created a commission to negotiate 59 utility contracts, the tariffs in those contracts, um, that had been affected by the economic collapse. The commission later on, the name of the commission was changed, and the functions of the commission were expanded. But in a nutshell. In practice, the work of the commission never really finished because it was the president himself and a handful of advisors in the, in the cabinet that took it upon themselves to negotiate periodically with each utility company in a sort of an ad hoc and informal manner. They were negotiating the tariffs. And this informal negotiating, pro negotiating process lasted for 12 years until the end of the Kirchner era in December of 2015. This style of negotiation on a one-to-one -one informal way gave President Kirchner an opportunity to, on the one hand, make sure to control utility companies so that he made, made sure that they wouldn't raise tariffs, although the law didn't allow them to do so anyway. And on the other hand, President Kirchner kept his constituency happy because they were paying lower tariffs than, than the market allowed for, especially when Argentina began to quickly recover economically. This personalized, informal, and rather politicized way of doing business is very common in Argentina, and it's particularly common in the oil and gas sectors. And in my opinion, it is this style of governing that greatly contributes to undermining the rule of law in the oil and gas sector. And I'm going to talk now about four elements that I think are instrumental in weakening the rule of law in the oil and gas sector. In the first place, there's what I call, or what actually what is called delegative democracy, which is a, a term that was um, coined by the late well-known political scientist Guillermo O'Donnell. What we understand by this is when the electorate gives 
the power on puts the power or delegates the power on the president who suddenly becomes the quote unquote rescuer in times of crisis the president becomes the main custodian of people's interests and the electorate just participates through elections either to sanction the president if they're not happy with what he or she is doing or to reward the president through re-election. Uh, in a way, what happened in December with Christina Kirchner, it was a quote-unquote sanction of, of her presidency. So the, the electorate practices this sort of vertical accountability. But what is missing in this style of governing is the horizontal accountability that is usually... Um, present or given by agencies that are, are there, other government agencies that are there to either sanction or to monitor government actions. Because this personalized government system ends up weakening the institutions of accountability, such as, for example, Congress and the judiciary. And in the end, this erodes the rule of law. So that's the first element. The second element that I think also contributes to undermining the rule of law in the oil and gas se sector, and which is very much related to the first one, is hyper-presidentialism. And it comes together with this personalized government style that we've been talking about, and it is extremely common in the oil and gas sector in Argentina. It is very much emphasized by the emergency powers that are granted by Congress to the president to resolve economic crisis. And as we know, Argentina has a lot of economic crisis, so this happens very often. In, in, this, uh, in this context of hyper-presidentialism, traditional institutions are typically sidestepped and new ones are created. For example, the commission that I mentioned at the beginning to renegotiate the utility contracts. And that commission sidestepped during the Kirchner eras to traditional government agencies, the industry secretariat, which is normally in charge of making energy planning and policies, and under the secretariat, the Energas, which is an autonomous agency in charge of supervising um, transportation and distribution of natural gas. Both these traditional agencies were relegated to secondary roles, and it was the new commission that took over, but in fact, it was the president himself and uh, a handful of people around him that took over the negotiations because the commission was also sidestepped. The third element that I think undermines uh, the rule of law in, sorry, I forgot to pass this, late, this, this slide. So I was saying that it is it was President Kishner to, who, to, who was taking control and that's why we see that photo of him there. The third element that I think undermines the rule of law in the oil and gas sector is the popular perception of a weak and corrupt judiciary. And um, interestingly, there's some data that shows that these perceptions of a weak judiciary may actually be not that true to reality. There's an indicator of the World Bank doing business um, database base that you see there that ranks the quality of contract enforcement in Argentina. And as you can see there on that chart, Argentina ranks quite high among its Latin American uh, peers. That indicator also measures the, the quality of judicial processes. And as you can see there, again, Argentina ranks very well, not only among Latin American countries, but also among OECD countries. What this indicator measures is how long it takes to get a process, a dispute resolved, and how much it costs, and the quality of a judicial process that it takes to get a first instance court um, in Buenos Aires resolve a commercial dispute of this kind. Now, interestingly, there's other indicators that say the contrary. The worldwide governance indicators, also um, uh, supported by the World Bank, they measure perceptions. And the perception is 
of that the rule of law indicator that you see there, as you can tell, Argentina ranks quite low among Latin American countries and among OECD countries. But this indicator uh, measures perceptions of the judiciary the judiciary, that is, the confidence that people have, the respect for, for the laws, and the quality of the contract enforcement. Now, on the one hand, the qualitative measurements of the, of the doing business of this one um, database gives us a relatively positive picture of the judiciary while the second one that measures perceptions tells us that the people think that the judiciary is not really working very well. So the question is, what is it that helps to build such low perception of the judiciary? Well, I, I have a, a few ideas um, of issues that can contribute to that low perception. One of them is what I was talking about before, the tendency of the executive for undermining the rule of law. And this it does by leaving the judiciary on the sidelines of deal making. And at the same time, the emergency powers granted to the president tend to reduce the checks and balances that are normally done by the judiciary and by Congress. And so this helps to build a perception of a weak and inefficient judiciary because they're always on the sidelines. Um, a parenthesis here, some people um, during my research have said that this sidelining of the judiciary is not only supported by the executive so that it, it can have more control of the process, but it's also supported by some elites because they prefer a weak judiciary so as to reduce checks and balances. And a, 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 a third element that I think also contributes to contributes to a negative perception of the judiciary is some kind of self-restraint on the part of judges for fear of retaliation by the executive. And this is especially true when the president holds a majority in Congress that might recommend congressional impeachment of the judges, especially if the judges become an, ob an obstacle to the president's goal. And this is exactly what happened during the, the last uh, uh, Kirchner period. So I talked about delegative democracy, hyper-presidentialism, and a perception of weak, corrupt, and inefficient judiciary. The last element that I think also contributes to side lightening the, the rule of law in the oil and gas sector is what I call coordinated federalism. So as you probably know, Argentina is a federal country, and it is very decentralized. The producing provinces, they charge their own royalties, they grant their own alliances, they call their own bidding rounds, they share some oil-related taxes with the central government. But in spite of this economic independence, uh, in theory, because they get all these oil revenues, the producing provinces cannot meet their budget, and they depend on federal tra transfers. From the, from the central government. So this kind of relationship encourages perverse incentives by which the, these perverse incentives that I call federalism that is coordinated between the central government and the provinces by which the province gives votes in Congress, national or provincial, in exchange for more money. And so this type of um, federal, of coordinated federalism helps governors to become, uh, governors of producing states to become very powerful because they're very powerful politically. They can be instrumental in breaking congressional stale stalemates, for example, and they're very powerful economically because they sit on important natural resource assets at home and they also receive windfall money transfers from the central government. So breaking this pattern of perverse relationships between the center and the periphery and, uh, and, and of a, a strong presidential figure that makes decisions in the sector regardless or on the sidelines of other institutions, this is not, not going to be easy. And it's not going to be easy because it's, I think, 
part of the culture of the country. So I think it's always going to be there and that we have to work around it. Now, I have a few quick ideas to conclude about what might be the right direction in, in trying to, to get a better, um, institu more institutionalized governance of the oil and gas se sector. Um, one suggestion is to try to get to open the playing field, to get more stakeholders and the populations involved in the oil and gas sector, to not to make it so secretive. So designing a long-term vision of oil and gas, uh, of the oil and gas sector, including a roadmap and an implementation map with deadlines and with periods when those deadlines should, those uh, projects should be ach achieved. And this needs the participation and the support and the consensus of the main stakeholders. And then a second element to be able to do that is to include, to improve the existing public participation mechanisms, which are, are rather limited in my opinion, and uh, the ones that exist are not really exercised very, very much. A third element is to, to create an expert commission to try to reinforce the role of agencies that oversee public utilities and energy services. For example, the NRGAS that I said at the beginning in the past 12 years has been set aside, basically. And lastly, to, to try to build a multi-stakeholder consensus, a society consensus about the society, about the oil and gas industry. And this consensus, there are several issues that need consensus. Two of them that are key, I think, that are still going around and being unresolved are, one, the provincial versus federal domain of oil and gas re uh, resources. And the second one is the state versus the private development of the oil and gas sector. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to hearing the Q&A. Thank you, Patricia. Very interesting. Lots of uh, elements there that we can get into. Just a reminder, I'm going to type a question word question here there we go so that's where folks will pose questions to uh, to patricia and we'll we'll field them patricia i want to i want to pick up on on this key piece here you know you mentioned energas but it's when we take the broader energy sector in argentina one of the things we've heard several times in various presentations from the new administration's energy authorities is normalizing the sector and when you dive into that, what they mean is going back to the laws that are on the books for NR gas, for NRA, for how the market's supposed to operate, and in trying to actually reset all of those institutions to function as they were by law set up to function. So the question I have for you is, that makes sense. You pointed to how important that is, and uh, especially in demonstrating rule of law. So my question, the simple question to you is, can that happen in the Macri government period of four years? But maybe uh, is that something that, that they can even do before the, the midterm elections and that people will start getting antsy if there's not better results? So yeah, that's... That timeline. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Okay. That's a very good question, Jeremy. And I think it's a question that we're all asking ourselves. Um, whether they're going to be able to do all that to recreate the institutions in the sector in four years, I think, you know, it, it takes it takes less time to undo than to rebuild. So I think maybe four years is going to be limited. But what they will be able to do is to set the the basis, to set the framework. Uh, which is no longer there. Uh, this doesn't mean to say that there are no, that there are very good people still in Argentina, very good technicians, but they have all been sidelined. So we need to get those people and those institutions back on track. And we need to redefine their role. And we need to, to, um, to do this in order to support the rule of law, which is what investors are demanding and 
as you well probably well know, the development of the oil and gas se sector, the success of that development will largely depend on the investments that the government is going to be able to get. So the answer is, well, this is not going to happen from one day to the next, but there are signs already, strong signs, that, that the government is moving in the right direction. And maybe they will leave the, the job unfinished for the next administration to take over. Or if they do enough to convince the government or the, the population, they'll be reelected. But let's, uh, <laughs> that's yes. a bit of a crystal ball. Uh, let's come back to that because I think there's there's different ways to continue to talk about that. There's a couple questions here. Um, <clears throat> let's start with the one that's, that's getting into uh, the, the element of price. Um, I'll, I'll read it verbatim. Besides the politics perceptions, Argentinian oil prices fixed generating an unusual cost price situation in the local market. Until when do you estimate that oil price will remain fixed? And uh, just just to so basically the Argent internal market in Argentina for internal oil production has a couple of different price um, fixed prices, correct? Yes. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So well, the price when the price of oil in, in, in international markets goes down goes down and Argentina goes up believe it or not because the government um, is subsidy they, they're continuing this policy from from the Kirchner administration they're subsidizing wellhead prices in order to be able to well for two, for two reasons in order to be able to attract investments hopefully that will happen soon but also in order to be able to um, contain a massive um, increase in unemployment in the oil and gas sector because uh, rig counts have gone down and, um, you know, they are, the, the international price context is not favorable for attracting investments, particularly more expensive non-conventional investments. So the government is doing this and I think that they are obliged to do this, if you will, uh, to prevent internally, to prevent uh, more domestic, um, from people to being too unhappy. Uh, people are already unhappy because they're getting rid of subsidies and uh, utility tariffs have gone up by 300, 400 percent. Plus, um, they're trying to avoid adding to that huge unemployment in, in the oil and gas sector. For how long? They will be able to sustain this. That's a one million dollar question. Um, my understanding is that the government is going to sustain high, higher wellhead prices until the international price of oil reaches fifty five dollars per barrel. Um, what I don't see happening, or at least my impression, is that. The government is perhaps being, they're not taken, taking enough precautionary measures in case that doesn't happen in the near future, or if it happens, it is not sustainable. So I don't see the macro administration preparing for uh, a scenario of a low international oil price, which means that investments are not going to come that often and which means that maybe employment might be hurt. From the government perspective, maintaining these subsidies is going to be so costly. I haven't seen any data, but um, there's a lot of economists out there wondering for how long they're going to be able to, to sustain this. Yeah, no, and I think the government, you know, so you mentioned the increase in the, the utilities, really power prices, gas, the domestic, ga uh, the household gas and power. And so, you know, there, there is a bit of an element there. Um, clearly, we see now in the winter arrival uh, stories on, on importation of large scale, um, large scale energy import, uh, importation, ener energy via LNG largely these days. Um, so, you know, that's sort of more of the same, which I think indicates sort of how much work this new government has to do, as you pointed out, to overcome 
12 years of, of you know unraveling so let's let's take another question because there was something that occurred late in the Kirchner era in terms of regulatory issues a new hydrocarbons law and there's a question here do you foresee major regulatory changes in the oil and gas se sector under Macri or will the government the current government work with the regulatory framework appro approved in late 2014 by the predecessor so that's that oil and gas law of, of, of late in the Kirchner era so, so talk a little bit about that yeah, um, my feeling is that for the time being, they are going to continue to work with la that law because the private sector is pretty much happy for the moment with that law. It uh, it got rid of, of, of a lot of um, investment restrictions uh, that the previous legal uh, framework had. So in my opinion, they will continue with that uh, framework until the international price of oil recovers. And at that point, they will be a little more uh, in, a, in a better position to when, when investors show more interest in coming, they will be in a better position to maybe talk about a different um, framework. What, what is important about that framework at this stage is that I think it gives it, YPF has a very important role to play in this context uh, of difficult economic uh, situation and uh, a low international price of oil, a regional situation that is difficult for Argentina with its main trading partner Brazil going through a recession and a lot of issues. YPF has an important role to play because um, I think it can lead the way um, into maybe reducing some some costs eventually of production. As you know, pr uh, production costs are very high and our labor costs are very high and productivity is not very high. And in my opinion, there is not much they can do by law to change that today because that would mean a lot of confrontations with the unions, which are very strong. And in this context of very volatile economic issues, I don't think that the country is going to get into, into changing that. But what YPF can do is, given the resources, they can do um, exploration and, and they can help by, in fact, they have started doing, um, re reducing some production costs in, in the past years, and they can uh, lower the risks by doing the initial exploration costs. And I think that's part of the, of the goal that they're looking at. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, we have a couple other questions, but I want to take a, a tangent here to follow up on this point you just made, because let, let's take the unconventionals, because really a lot of what we're talking about here in terms of the interest and the big big scale items, you know, Vaca Muerta, but the, the, the unconventionals. And, and the big knock in, on, on Argentina be, becoming a real serious producer of oil and gas from unconventionals has been the cost element, and, and not just from labor, but overall in terms of what it costs to be able to produce unconventional resources, the amount of drilling, the amount of, of logistics, and all the elements that go into commercial, serious commercial production of unconventionals. Where where does uh, where does that stand? I mean, have you know, speaking of YPF, but also with its partners, have they be, been able to come up on the learning curve and seriously reduce those costs to to be able to be able to, to do serious unconventional um, production? Um, YPF in the past three or four years, they said that they have reduced um, uh, expiration costs and for uh, for non conventional. Um, I can't remember exactly the, the amounts, but I think they went from 14 million a well to 10 or something like that. So I think, like I said before, that it is going to be YPF taking those investment risks at this level of international oil price. It is not mm -hmm. going to be private companies taking that risk. Um, I think that once the or the price of oil goes up, international companies are going to join YPF in trying to do what they did in the United States and trying to um, make it more profitable to, to produce non-conventional because 
it, because I mean, let's face it, those, these resources are not found everywhere. And Argentina is now presenting uh, a very interesting and hopefully lasting long-term sustainable framework for them to be able to come. The only thing that they need is is uh, a good uh, a good pricing. So in that context, I think that reducing um, costs of exploration and production in the long run is, is going to happen. What is a little more complicated is reducing labor costs. It's a little more mm -hmm. complicated because the unions, the oil unions, oil workers unions are very powerful and that has always, the, the laws are completely for them, protecting them, and that increases the costs of production very much for companies. And that has, this has been the main issue uh, that companies always bring up. And so that, like I said before, this is not the right time in this uh, uh, context of economic volatility for the government to address that, to simplify labor laws for oil uh, unions. But eventually, when when the whole oil market starts to work, I think that that's inevitable. They're, they're going to have to address that. Well, that's clearly not just the unconventional. That's that's the entire right. I mean, that's yes. that's any kind of hydrocarbons. So so there must be an element of I know that you know individual companies and depending on the regions have different relationships with you know and there, there's a lot of consensus building, which I think you talked a little bit about in, in terms of that needing to happen on a broader level. Let's let's talk. There's an interesting question here on sort of a, a strategic resource nationalism kind of uh, framework. Um, many believe that foreign investment in strategic natural resources such as oil and gas can be dangerous um, in terms of conflict over natural and, and perhaps natural disasters. So I guess the question is, you know, what what would be the advantages from their point of view? So in other words, what is what is the upside to Argentina, uh, you know, exploiting, especially on the back of, of foreign and private investment, strategic resources such as, and this, I mean, I'm adding this part, but such as shale and, and hydrocarbons? Um, the advantage, you mean from companies' perspectives? Um, um, yeah, that's not quite clear to me from the question, but I think it's, uh, the, then you believe the foreign investment strategic natural resource. Yeah, I, I think so. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, okay. Uh, the Argentina uh, apparently, we still don't know. More more tests are needed. Argentina is sitting on all these uh, non-conventional resources. Uh, the country is moving into a governance. Um, framework that is going to be more um, is going to be better to make it easy for companies to come in and invest so all those are advantages I mean in that context and in the context of what I described before where everything is negotiable in Argentina and within the law all that I described is there are very few examples of things that happen um, outside of the law. All the agreements and personalized decisions are all within the law. Within that context, which is always going to happen, more or less, but it's always going to be there in Argentina, I think there's a lot of, there are going to be a lot of opportunities for for uh, for investments and, and for, for having good returns. Again, especially because these non-conventional resources, um, they're not found everywhere. And they're not found in, in in other places in a context where of of a of a changing framework in the positive direction. So, so that's I, somebody wrote a question right here. I think that's a perfect segue. We'll jump to this question. Um, this is: in, Do you think it was a mistake to spend such an amount of money, time in Vaca, in Vaca Muerta's vertical drill, drillings? In other words, the you know the the, the money and effort spent to date in exploiting Vaca Muerta unconventional uh, drilling. And then the second part of the, or the second question is how difficult will it be for the Macri government to attract foreign capital to develop unconventional in this investment environment? So a couple of, of, uh, of questions that follow on the last statement. I don't think that it was a mistake at all. I think that most of the of the work there was done with, by, by YPF and uh, Chevron. But YPF is trying to take the lead, and I think that is a very good idea in this context. Because if YPF takes the lead, they may, in in, in exploration, they may eventually um, reduce risks 
risk costs for other companies, other players uh, wanting to come in. They will start to know what's in there, how 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 deep mm -hmm. the resources are, how difficult and costly it is to take them out. So having that information at hand um, would be very important, very important for the cost structure, the future cost structure of, of developing Vaca Muerta. Um, the difficulty in attracting private, private investors today I think is mainly related to the international price of oil. Secondly, there's what we've been discussing, high labor costs, but like I said, high labor costs can be discussed. Okay, we can, in a, in a different context of less economic volatility and high international oil prices, um, I am pretty sure that those issues and maybe a, a reform of the law or something like that can, can be discussed. Not without certain disputes and conflicts and differences. That's always going to be there. It's part of the culture. But, but um, uh, the, the only thing is that and while the price of oil remains low, um, companies probably are not as interested in taking the risk of going into a country which is going in the right direction, but still it's been just five or six months and you know, they still have to prove themselves. I, I mean, absolutely. You, you just were sort of my, my dos centavos on this last question. I mean, I think you're absolutely right about those two elements, but the, you hit on a key piece and that is the Argentina risk element. And so we've seen efforts by the Macri government when it comes to, you know, making, you know, in, in terms of the, the 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 debt, the holdouts, all of these elements that will allow the country to be less of an international financial pariah. However, in terms of major infrastructure, large scale, long term investments, it I think every company is going to make a different evaluation on the quote unquote Argentina risk. And like you said, it's going to take a lot more than five or six months of of heading in the right direction, perhaps for some companies to uh, to to jump in head first. So that it'll be interesting to see how much confidence this new government can build and how much of the Argentina risk they can diminish given what they've done so far so yeah and it's a little bit tuned. of uh, and it's a little bit just just to finish that thought it's a little bit of, of a catch-22 for the macro administration because they need investments to be able to succeed and uh, but they are in in a, in a context where companies are not going to jump in tomorrow so they need more reassurance reassurances so there is a, a huge a plan the plan belgrano that is starting in the second half of the year for infrastructure improvement not just in the oil sector but in general and, and it will contribute to some parts of the country where oil is is uh, is produced so i think that that is that is aimed at generating employment, generating trust, and uh, improving infrastructure at the same time. So they are doing things in the right direction. If they will be able to do everything fast and convince investors, we'll see. <laughs> it, it's a good point because we're focused on the oil and gas sector today. But if you if you look at the last few months, um, there's been a tremendous effort for the government to boost uh, investment in renewable energy, and they've done an auction right. in, in the process of developing an auction. And going back to this Argentina risk question, one of the key things that they've done in developing that framework for the auction is bring in a guarantee and a, through the, the PPA mechanism with a guarantee that I understand is going to be largely on the back of a World Bank guarantee. Yes. And so you start to see that that's how they're going to instill you know, the confidence in the investor through guarantees such as a World Bank backed um, guarantee through I think the central bank. Um, there's a fund they're actually going to set up as part of that guarantee, the PPA payments of the renewable auction. So anyway, a little bit of a tangent, but let's let's wrap up. We're almost out of time and I want to get to a couple other questions people have posted here. Um, let, let's take this question uh, of natural gas and the Argentina has significant power needs and is importing natural gas. As I mentioned, there's there's lots of headlines now as winter comes with uh, increased importation of LNG. So the question is, what incentives, policy changes are required to get shale gas development to take place? Well, there's obviously the price incentive, and the government is giving that price incentive through the subsidy uh, to well head prices. That, for the moment, has 
resulted in some uh, expressions of interest from several companies, important companies, but still there's just expressions of, of interest. Uh, we need all these other issues that we're discussing here today that bring Argentina's risk up. We need all that to be in place to be able to convince investors to, to come back in. Mind you, Argentina, and this is what this discussion is about today, Argentina is never going to be Norway. So if there are investors in there, if there are investors out there waiting for that Norway moment, that's never going to happen. <laughs> but um, uh, the, the again the there's the right this government is offering the right framework whether that is going to be sustainable throughout the term of a 40 year non convention license that's a 1 million dollar question probably the answer to that would be no but then companies are used to that so um, Argentina has it, its its main immediate goal is to require its self sufficiency. It is uh, ridiculous that a country that used to export natural gas is now paying all all this money to 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 import it and having all these shortages problems. So that is the main goal of the government, and they're banking on YPF doing that. I have my doubt that YPF is going to be able to do that alone. So they really need investors. So there was one question. We've got a late, a late question here. Let me take the very uh, last part of this question because I think we've talked about some of the legal and contractual elements. But let's, something we haven't talked about is what is the situation with currency controls and exchange? Talk a little bit about the, the, what, what's going on with the, that side of the financial equation. Well, the, the government lifted all currency controls. They lifted all export controls. Um, in Argentina now, um, companies can repatri repatriate their, their earnings. So the, the, the financial context for an investor is, is looking pretty good. Um, especially coming from a background from from two years of of, of all those restrictions that that uh, didn't didn't let the the sector move on. So I think that um, the, there's not much more. Maybe there's a lot more things that the government could do, but for the moment, I think that they're doing pretty well. They lifted export uh, taxes, financial restrictions. They're lifting an energy subsidies. They're keeping up um, uh, the price prices of, at the wellhead. Uh, they they picked a CEO at YPF who is very well respected in in the in the in the in the private sector. So all the signals are there. That's a gentleman who has a long history in Total, if I recall right. Yes, 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 and he's pretty much. I think um, his background is pretty much in the same guy, um, in the same um, way, the same background as Galucho. The problem is that Galucho was uh, his appointment was politically charged, regardless of his of of whether he was good or bad. Technically, he was excellent right. technically, but obviously he they couldn't keep him there. Well, let's wrap up with a, a question here that was more of a, it, it, it's how can we support Argentina's government in order to improve its legal framework in oil and gas through which institution? So you talked about a roadmap. So you answer this question and sort of uh, in, in, in synopsize the, uh, the conversation we've had this morning. Yeah, what, so the oil sector um, is not, has lost its institutions. The oil sector the institutions are there and the people are there. It's a little bit like the index that measures inflation. Mm -hmm. The people are there, but it was inactive for for many years. And so now the government needs um, a roadmap to be able to, to recreate the institutions. Um, they need to, to be able to reestablish the functioning of regulating agencies. Without those agencies, it's, it's very difficult to, to attract investments because it's very difficult to function. They, they need also to, to, to bring in transparency to the sector. A lot of decisions were taken uh, behind doors, and, and this is not the way that people are going to feel, quote-unquote, ownership of their 
of their oil and gas sector and this is and this is what is needed at this stage in time and i know that the minister um is trying to go in that direction and again this is going to take some time and effort and work but it's doable because there are still good people there good technicians the institutions are there they're just taking a nap for a while but they'll they'll, they'll be able to to bring them back i think yeah i i, I think you're absolutely right and the, the, the million dollar question we got into earlier was is the term, at least the first term of the Macri government in four years, enough time to be able to really normalize, is the word they use, but really professionalize once again and bring right. back in, in the fashion of the law that's on the books the way those organizations, institutions, NRA, uh, and our gas are supposed to function. So we'll have to leave it there. I think that's that's a lot of. Uh, I think the good thing is we're all hopeful here. We all have. Uh, we definitely have a glass that's half full when it comes to Argentina these days. Which uh, which after ten or twelve years of a glass being you know a couple of drops in it is is welcome. Yes, absolutely. I and I think that's where where this paper was going to to bring in some um, positive waves. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing us your insights uh, and, the, and the work of that paper that you wrote for the Wilson Center, uh, Patricia Vasquez. Thanks a lot. And uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention another country that's going through uh, political change. Um, uh, the, every, if, yeah, unless you were living under a rock, you heard that uh, PPK, PPK, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, won the election in Peru after, uh, after much um, uh, analysis of the vote, something like 40,000 vote difference out of 17 million total votes. But PPK caused the new president of Peru as of July 28th. And we think that's an opportune time to convene a discussion and see what his government, uh, lots of mixed signals during the campaign as to what his government's going to do in the energy sector. Um, obviously, we want to also understand what the uh, intentions are in the terms of regional integration. So there you go on the screen, September 14th and 15th, we'll have a, a session in Lima. And uh, thank you all. Thanks again, Patricia. Thanks for joining us this morning. Apologies for that a little bit of uh, hiccup with the audio, but it all worked out and was fantastic. So thanks a lot. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.